Right, well now that I previewed everything, uh, we're just going to kind of go through this in a little bit more detail. Let me begin by reading uh, the, the text, two verses from Luke 17, which remember last week we were looking at what Jesus was telling the, the Pharisees about the end of the road, where they were headed for their desire for the world, their desire for riches, um, through the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And then having said that, he turns to his disciples. Now, I am going to make reference to what has come before to, to see why it is that Jesus brings this topic up at this particular point. But Luke 17, verses 1 and 2. He said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Um, so here, um, here's really the, the two verses we want to look at. And again, we've already seen the larger picture and what it is he's referring to here. But let's spend a little bit of time considering what he means and why it's better uh, that such a person uh, would actually be drowned in the sea than that he would do what Jesus warns them against. Now, obviously this morning Jesus is warning his disciples about stumbling blocks. And stumbling blocks are those things that anyone might put uh, in the way of a, of a believer, in, the, in our way, uh, that would cause us to stumble or fall, uh, to disobey God or his law in some way, to encourage us to fall into sin. And he is particularly warning those who would actually bring these stumbling blocks. Now, of course, we want to ask the question, why did Jesus say this? Well, it was because, obviously, of the Pharisees. This comes right at the end of Jesus reproving them for the many ways in which they were failing to do what he had actually called them to do. But let's not forget the Pharisees were the religious leaders of Israel. They had a stewardship entrusted to them, right? Uh, they were, it was their duty to lead God's people in his truth, to teach them what, what is right, what is wrong. It was their duty to look at the signs of the times according to the scriptures and to know when Messiah was coming. It was their duty to point the people to Messiah when he came in order that they might enter into his kingdom. But then we have to ask the question, just how well did they live up to this stewardship? Well, they were failing, right, as God's shepherds. The, um, well, the, the sheep were scattered. They weren't going after them. Uh, far from leading the Jews to the Messiah, they were actually leading them away from the Messiah by rejecting John's message, John the Baptist, by rejecting Jesus when he came. And they were teaching, of course, instead of Jesus, what you really need to do is, is follow us, follow our example, keep the law of God, and everything will be well. Now, last time Jesus warned them, you know, through the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, what was at the end of that road? What was at the end of their journey? As the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, so would they if they did not repent. But so would those who actually listened to them. Jesus goes on now to tell his disciples just how serious a sin that actually is. That it would be better for those who would do this, that it would be better for them to have a heavy stone tied around their necks and for them to be drowned in the sea than to put a stumbling block before uh, those who believe in him. Now, what Jesus is doing this morning is, of course, giving to his disciples a warning, but he's giving to us, of course, a warning to watch out for those who would do this, uh, to those uh, you know, who would, uh, well, basically to watch out that we don't get stumbled, to watch out for those who would stumble us, but also uh, to warn us that we should not do anything like this, anything of the same kind, never to put a stumbling block in front of a brother or sister's way. Now, Jesus begins by telling us something that uh, I think we, we understand to be true, um, but we need to, of course, uh, be reminded of, and that is that it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. Now, as a stumbling block, as I've already told you, is, is anything that has the potential 
to cause us to fall into any kind of sin. And certainly, when we think about the number of things that can do that, we have to realize that stumbling blocks come in many different forms. Uh, one of those is bad teaching. And that's certainly what the Pharisees were guilty of. The Pharisees were teaching that one enters into the kingdom not by trusting in Jesus, but by doing the works that God requires of us. We have to make ourselves good enough. Well, Paul tells us that those who try to earn their own righteousness by keeping the law of God are actually under God's curse, and they're excluded from the kingdom of heaven. He says in Galatians 3, verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. You know, the Bible actually says that we come into this world already under the curse, okay? The curse is the curse of the broken covenant of works, the, the covenant that Adam failed. We're under the judgment of God. We're already condemned to death. We're condemned to hell. We come into this world spiritually dead. That's what the curse is. And as long as we continue to try to rectify or to change those things through our own obedience, we remain under that curse because we can't do well enough. We, if we were to be uh, justified by the law, we would have to keep it absolutely perfectly, and we could not fail even at one point. But of course, we come into the world having already failed. Well, this is, again, this is what the Pharisees were teaching the Jews to do in order to be saved. Jesus is saying to us that those who would listen to them and follow them would be condemned to the same fate as they. Jesus says in Matthew 23, verses 15, uh, verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Jesus says, beware of stumbling blocks. The, the Pharisees were stumbling blocks. Now, we have stumbling blocks today along these same lines. We have people that are out there that are teaching things that are not true, things that if we actually believed would be serious enough for us to miss the kingdom of heaven in the same way that the Pharisees were stumbling the Jews or would attempt to stumble the disciples. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus is God in our nature, okay? They have the wrong Jesus, and the wrong Jesus cannot save you. They believe that God is only one person, that He is the Father. They have the wrong God, and if you have the wrong God, you can't have the right Jesus. They believe that the only way to enter into the kingdom of heaven, and I, I asked the Jehovah's Witness once how one is saved. And on this occasion, it was a woman. She said this, join our organization, study the Bible with us, go door to door with us, and when you die, you will enter into, well, actually, actually when you, not when you die, but when um, <clears throat> all is said and done on the day of resurrection, you're going to enter into a paradise on earth. So you're saved by, by basically your works. Um, well, again, the Jehovah's Witnesses have stumbled many people with this teaching. Do you know that uh, this is one thing they love to boast about? Most of their converts actually come from Bible-believing churches, churches that believe the Trinity. But because they haven't been grounded in that teaching, they're deceived by the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they are led away into their organization. Well, Jesus, of course, tells us that if they never come out of that organization and continue to believe the lie, that they will end up in the same boat as the Jehovah's Witnesses on the Day of Judgment. They will not be saved. If we had time, we could go into Mormonism, uh, many gods, United Pentecostalism, one person, but that's Jesus, and He is the Father, He is the Son, He is the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Apostolic Church believes the same thing. Islam, which has an entirely false god, and Jesus is only a prophet. Liberal Christianity, it's just a fable, just a story. Uh, to relay spiritual truth, secularism, which denies the Bible entirely, atheism, there is no God. All of these are stumbling blocks that are put in our path in the world by our enemy to keep people from coming to Jesus 
and once we've come to try to get us to fall away from Jesus. So it comes in the form of, of lies. It comes in the, you know, in the form of false doctrine, uh, things that, that are not true. By the way, that can be also ethical truth as well. Stumbling blocks come in the form of bad examples, don't they? The Jews looked up to the Pharisees as those most likely to enter into the kingdom of heaven because they were such holy and righteous and, and pious men. So they tried to follow their example. Um, but was their example a good example? Uh, obviously not, because they were just putting on a show for men, and they did not really love the Lord. Have you ever been tempted to do something that you know the Bible says is wrong because you saw somebody that you looked up to doing it, or maybe you saw uh, the, the church that, that you're involved in doing it, or maybe a majority of Christians, uh, or at least professing Christians, actually do that? You know, examples, examples can stumble us. You know, one of the main ways that I think the evangelical church today is giving us a bad example that is stumbling us is that they are downplaying so much, dismissing what God calls us to do, the kind of zeal He calls us to have, the kind of life He calls us to live. And we see the majority of the church not taking these things seriously, and that example stumbles us and makes us at least tempts us not to take it as seriously as well. We, we need to be careful. Paul tells us, as we've already seen, uh, to be sure that we don't do this to one another. It, it's possible to give bad examples that can uh, cause other people or give them excuses to sin. And as I already pointed out, we can even do this in, in an area where what we're doing isn't even actually sin. If we strengthen our brother or sister's conscience to do something against their conscience, we are stumbling them. Now, our Lord is also talking about stumbling blocks come in the form of those who actually might tempt us or entice us to sin. You know, if you read the book of Proverbs, it's a book that uh, Solomon essentially wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to teach the law to the people of God, but it's addressed to his children. Have you ever noticed that? And that's because the naive and the youthful are the ones who need this instruction more than anyone to avoid certain things. Well, what are the things that Solomon warns more than anything else? Essentially, two. The first one is bad company. Uh, he writes in, um, well, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 10 through 15, he says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without cause, let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole, as those who go down to the pit, we will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with spoil, throw in your lot with us, and we shall all have one purse. Now, you know, that, doesn't that sound kind of foreign? It sounds sort of out there and distant. But you know, you know what Solomon's talking about here? He's talking about gang activity isn't he? That's exactly what gangs do. Come with us. We're going to ambush somebody. We're going to take what they have. We're going to make it ours. And if we have to, we'll even kill them, okay? So this is an ancient form of gang activity. And he's warning us against this. He's warning, uh, you know, our youth against it because they would be liable to fall into that particular stumbling block. It actually refers to any kind of bad peer pressure that is in the world, anyone who would encourage us to do something that is wrong. Now, Solomon tells us to avoid them. He says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. So stay away from bad examples. Stay away from peer pressure, those who would try to get you to do something sinful. The second thing that he warns against is sexual immorality, particularly Adultery. The one thing that keeps cropping up again and again in the book of Proverbs is the adulterous woman. He says in verse 11 and then verses 16 through 19, discretion will guard you, understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, that is her marriage covenant, for her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. Okay, peer pressure, 
sexual immorality, there are people in the world that are seeking to stumble us. Now, these are just a few of the stumbling blocks that actually do exist in the world that are out there. But Jesus tells us they are inevitable. He literally is saying here in, in the original language, it's impossible that they should not come. In other words, you need to count on it. Okay? Now, why is that? Well, it's because of the nature of the world in which we live. It's, it's a fallen world. The world is the enemy of God. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 3, those who are in the world, this characterizes everyone outside of Christ, they live in the lust of their flesh. They indulge the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And the reason why they do that is because by nature they are the children of wrath. Okay? They're under God's curse still. They're under the curse. They have corrupt hearts. You know, I was asked the question recently, does the Bible say that people who are in the world can't be nice? No, they can be, they can be nice. They can be good neighbors. They can outstrip us in their benevolence, in their giving, in their philanthropy, and in helping other people. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says unbelievers can't be nice people and can't be friendly neighbors and, and people that are fun to be around. But what it does say about them is that they, they hate God. And as soon as they're confronted with the holy God and his standards and, and his commandments, that's when you see the evil of their hearts. That's when you see the reaction because they do not want to do this. Okay? So that is what the world is like. And because of that, there are so many things in the world that come through them that can tempt us. The, the world is one huge stumbling block. It's inevitable they're going to come because we live in a world that is full of people that are going to try to stumble us. They might not even be necessarily trying to. It's just the way they live, and it's going to tempt us to go that direction. Second, of course, it's, it's inevitable because of the one who's behind the world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now working in the sons of disobedience. Satan is very real. His demons are real. And what Thomas Brooks says in his precious remedies against Satan's devices is real, that Satan is a master fisherman. He's, he knows how to trap us. He knows how to ensnare us. He knows how to bait his hooks so that he can get us on the line. He knows exactly what it is that he needs to do to stumble us, which is why Peter writes this in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through 9. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's real. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So stumbling blocks are inevitable because of the nature of the world in which we live and because of the nature of the one who is behind the world in which we live. But thirdly, they're inevitable for another reason that we don't often think of. And that is because God has actually planned and purposed to use these stumbling blocks that are in the world to help us. Okay? Now, from one perspective, stumbling blocks come from evil hearts. It, it emanates from the evil that's in the world. But from another, God allows them. He uses the evil that is present in this world that came into the world through the devil and through Adam to actually help us, to help us grow into his image. You know, there's another sense or, that, or another word that we could use to refer to these stumbling blocks, and that is they are trials, okay? Trials that the Lord is using in our lives to help us, again, to become more like Jesus. James writes in James 1, verses 2 through 4, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, when you stop and think about it, God, who is sovereign, could put an end to evil in a moment, right? He could have stopped it when it came into the world with, with Adam and Eve. He could have stopped it before that uh, by stopping the devil, but he didn't do that. And the question is, why didn't he do that? Well, for many reasons. The, the, the greatest reason is because God allowed it that he might glorify himself, that he might show his justice in condemning the wicked and bringing judgment on those who commit sin. 
and in showing grace and mercy out of his mere good pleasure because it's pleasing to him on a multitude that no one can number. Okay, he wanted to glorify his grace and his mercy. But he allows sin to continue in the world because, and this again sounds strange, but I hope you've heard me say this before. John Gerstner said this, the mentor of uh, R.C. Sproul. It's good that there is evil. Now, that sounds strange, doesn't it? But what he means by this is this, that God uses evil for good purposes. God can't really cause us to grow unless he turns up the heat, okay? If, as we're spiritually working out, as it were, in God's gym, I think our tendency would be not to increase the weight, but kind of stay where we are. But, but the Lord comes in and he puts more weight on. He makes it a little bit more difficult for us. He uses the stumbling blocks, the sins of the world. He uses our own sin in order to help us to grow. Now, we know from the Scriptures that God never tempts anyone to sin. James writes this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. God doesn't tempt us, okay? But... Obviously, in his plan, he does allow us to come in contact with the evil that is in the world to test us. We only have to look as far as the book of Job, right? Satan came to God and he asked permission to afflict Job to basically put him under this trial and God told him he could. But Satan's purpose was to destroy him, that he might, you know, that Job might curse God to his face. But God's purpose in allowing it was that he might bless him. And that was the end of the whole trial. Job was blessed much more at the end than he was at the beginning, even though Job was likely the most righteous man at that time on earth, outside of perhaps Abraham. But again, it's relative because there is none righteous, not even one. But they were trusting the Lord and seeking to serve him. Jesus tells us it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come uh, they, they are things we have to face. But now we need to ask this question. You know, if God uses the evil for good purposes, does that mean that those who actually bring these stumbling blocks are doing something good and that leaves them off the hook? No, actually, the Lord says he's going to hold them accountable. Listen to what he says in verses 1 and 2 again. He says, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. You know, the fact is, God uses evil for good. God intends that the evil that he brings into our lives, he intends good things to come out of that. But you know what the intent of the person who brings those things into your life is? Not good, right? They mean it for evil. Think about Joseph's brothers, when they sold Joseph, basically when they took him and threw him into the pit and they wanted to kill him, and then they, uh, they decided instead to sell him to a group of Midianite traders who were going into Egypt, do you suppose that they meant that for good, for Joseph? <laughs> no, they hated Joseph, at least most of them, and they wanted to get rid of them. But do you know God was the one who actually allowed this? And do you know that God was the one who intended this as the means by which he would save them when he brought, of course, the famine and brought them all into Egypt because he prepared the way by sending Joseph ahead. God's intention was good, but it didn't cancel out their bad intentions. And because they freely chose to do what was evil, they were held responsible for that choice. God holds everyone responsible for the choices they make because they make those choices freely. That's what they want to do, and so they are accountable. So what does Jesus say about those who would stumble? He says, woe to him through whom they come. You know, the word woe means how horrible, how disastrous it will be. Woe is the language of, of curse. Well, just how horrible is it going to be for those who bring stumbling blocks? Well, it has to be bad, doesn't it? Because Jesus said it would be better to take a millstone, and, you know, I don't know if you have seen a millstone recently, but I looked up some images on, on Google. It shows this 
huge flat stone that's on the ground and this huge wheel, which is the millstone, right? And a donkey that's, that has to be the one that, to, to move it around in a circle because it's so heavy, it's hard to be moved by, by people. It's a very large stone. It would be better to take that and to tie it around this person's neck and to cast them into the sea. Why, why would you do that? Well, it would be because you were intending to drown them. It would be better that that happened to them than for them to stumble any of our Lord's little ones, by which he doesn't necessarily mean little children, but he's talking about those who actually believe in him. Now, why would that be better you know, than, than to stumble? You know, what's, what is it that he's, that he's going to do? Jesus is the judge, right? He's the one who sits in judgment on the final day. All judgment has been entrusted to him. What is Jesus going to do to them that is so horrible? Well, Jesus already warned the Pharisees where they were headed because of their greed, remember? They were headed to hell. They were the rich man in the parable who would die and lift up their eyes in hell and be in torment. What could be worse than that? And if they were drowned in the ocean... Wouldn't they end up there anyway? I mean, that, that isn't a way of salvation. I mean, Jesus isn't saying, you know, don't get stumbled, but instead drown yourself in the ocean and, and that way you'll be saved. That's not a method of salvation. That's bad too. And when they end up dying and drowning, they're going to end up in the fire anyway. So what is Jesus actually warning them against? Well, I think what he means is this. <clears throat> yes, they are going to go to hell unless they repent. He's already made that clear. But if they were drowned before, or let's say instead of continuing to stumble the ones that Jesus cares about, their punishment would not be as severe as it might otherwise be, right? Jesus tells us that on the day of judgment, everything that we have done, actually, the unbeliever has done, even every careless word that they speak is going to be brought up and they're going to have to give an account for it on the day of judgment. Absolutely everything. Everything they did will be weighed in the balance. Every sin will increase the severity of the judgment that they will receive. Paul writes in Romans 2.6, God will render to each person according to his deeds. Jesus warns in that parable in Luke chapter 12 about, about servants. You know, the one who knew his master's will but didn't get ready but did and um, committed deeds worthy of flogging will receive many lashes. And the one who didn't know his, his will but still did deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. And it's in the context of his coming again to bring judgment. There's more punishment and less punishment. The Lord is going to judge according to their deeds. And so that's why Jesus said it would be better to stop sinning. It would be better that you die now than that you commit this particular sin because there are degrees of punishment in hell. Jonathan Edwards once wrote, the damned in hell, because there are degrees of punishment, that the damned in hell would, would give the world, if it were in their possession, everything that they loved in this world, they would give it up to reduce the penalty of their guilt by just one, just by one sin because each sin makes it worse and worse and worse. So we know from Scripture that every sin is serious, but there are certain sins that are worse than others, and Jesus tells us this sin is particularly serious. We need to avoid stumbling. Now, again, uh, Jesus isn't referring to Christians who do this. He's referring to the unbelievers who do this, but the punishment for them is, is severe. So now the question is, realizing that this is the case, that there are stumbling blocks, it's inevitable that they come, what the penalty is for those who would stumble, we, we really ought to ask the question, how can we apply this? How can we benefit from it? Well, the first application obviously has to be this, that we be aware that there are stumbling blocks in the world, right? There are people who will try to stumble us, who will try to teach us wrong things, who will give us bad examples, who will try to entice us to do things we shouldn't do, who will get us to compromise our morals, even to deny the faith and to embrace the world. You know, they're working on us all the time. Have you never seen them? Sure, sure you have. When I was younger and I, I first became serious about my faith, I had a group of friends that um, didn't share my faith because I had been hanging around with the wrong crowd. And 
Uh, when I started trying to tell them about Jesus, the first thing they started to do was try to get me to let go of Jesus, you know, and try to intimidate me and try to belittle me and so forth. But by God's grace, thankfully, my desire for Jesus was stronger than my desire for them. But they, they are out there, okay, they're out there. I mean, we feel those pressures every day because of the world in which we live. Jesus says it is inevitable. It's everywhere. We need to be on our guard. Satan is holding out something to us virtually at all times, saying, just eat of this fruit. Just, just take a taste of this. It, it really tastes good. And you'll like it. It's not such a big thing, okay? So it's out there. Now, how can we avoid those things? Well, we need to know what a stumbling block is, right? Sometimes... We, we kind of go through this world and we don't understand what all those things are. So how do we learn what they are? Well, we have to get into God's Word because He's the one who tells us what we need to see, what we need to avoid, what we need to do. Stumbling blocks are going to try to get us to do things we shouldn't do or not to do things we should do. But the things we shouldn't do, the things we should do, all of those things are in the Word of God. We need to know what those things are so that when we see the temptation to do otherwise, we can recognize them. Now, secondly, we also need to understand that we don't have the strength that we need to be able to resist them on our own. Satan knows our weaknesses, and he knows the ones that we are particularly liable to, the sins we're liable to, and he will throw everything that he can at us to get us to fall. How are we going to resist him? Well, we can't do it again in our own strength. We need to do it in the Lord's strength. And so we need to go to Him in prayer. His power is the only thing that's going to keep us from falling. And so we need to rely upon Him. But we also need to be assured at the same time of victory. You realize that the Lord has told us He's not going to let us fall. No matter what the devil throws at us, he will, he, we may stumble, okay? We may go so far. But we will never fall entirely away from the Lord because the Lord is the one who holds us. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. So we, we need to trust that the Lord's not going to let us fall away. He loves us too much to allow that to happen. But in order not to fall away, we still need to be actively seeking Him for His strength and His power. We need to be turning away from our sins. We need to be putting those sins to death. We need to be, again, seeking to live like Jesus and follow Him. We, we become particularly liable when we think we are above a fall. You know, pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before stumbling, right? We need to make sure that we never think that we are above stumbling, that we are strongest when our love for the Lord is its strongest because that is how we resist the enemy. Now, lastly, we need to be careful, as, as I've already said, that we don't put stumbling blocks in a brother or sister's way. We need to do our very best to believe the truth and to encourage one another to walk in that truth, right? When we begin to compromise and then others see us and we encourage them to compromise, you know, sometimes that can happen because we want to strengthen our conviction that what we're doing is right. If we can convince somebody else that it's right, it makes us feel that it's right. And so we feel better about the way we're living. That, that's just stumbling a brother or a sister. So we need to know the truth. We need to speak the truth. We need to live the truth. We need to do everything we can to be an encouragement to our brothers and sisters to do what is right and not to be an encouragement for them to sin. Now, lastly, I mean, let me just say this. Um, Jesus here is specifically talking about unbelievers who are stumbling and the penalty that would fall upon them. This will not fall upon us if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though we might actually end up stumbling a brother or sister. This isn't going to happen to us. And the reason is because Jesus said he will never cast us away. So he's not going to condemn us. He's not going to cast us into hell for that. But he does want us to know it's still a serious matter. I mean, what did Paul say in our meditation except this, um, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. You know, don't do things that's going to work against what he is doing in the lives of others. So it's still very serious. So what is the Lord going to do to us if we happen to do this, uh, particularly if, if um, well, if we're guilty of this and we, we don't repent? Well, he's going to make sure we do repent. 
Okay, he loves us enough to come and to discipline us, to do what is necessary to get us to turn around again. And he's going to make sure these others that are stumbled as well are not going to fall away from him if they belong to him. So we need to be thankful for that, of course. But again, making sure that we don't allow ourselves in it for that reason. The discipline of the Lord is not an easy thing to go through. It can sometimes be very, very difficult. So let's not need discipline. Uh, let's make sure that we do the right thing. Let's make sure that we honor our Lord and encourage one another in the way that we should go by being good examples and motivators to, um, well, again, to good and righteous behavior. Well, let's, let's bow, shall we, in a, in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do that.